by now we are very much aware of the possibilities of AI. The possibilities that is afforded by AI applications such as ChatGPT or diffusion models such as DALI and Midjourney. They have proved to be very useful. They have proved to be indispensable even. They have been proved to be astonishingly capable, more capable in fact than many working in the field had imagined in the first place. But is there a dark side to these capabilities? Is there something negative about how capable they are? Recently, we've seen in the press a number of reports about the concerns that have been shared by those who are leaders in the field. A letter that was signed by Elon Musk asking for a pause in research to AI research. Jeffrey Hinton quitting Google in order to warn us about the dangers of AI. And people like Joshua Bengio, who has been one of the central figures in AI, being concerned about what his life's work had led to. So what is behind all this? Here I want to refer to something that has been called, that have been called large language models. The term is not particularly descriptive what they are. They are not just large, they are absolutely enormous. These are pre-trained neural networks that have been trained on an absolutely vast quanta, quant uh, quantity of data and involve billions of parameters. GPT-4 is perhaps the most, the most well-known uh, model so far. It, has a, it is an astonishingly large model that has proved to be amazingly effective. And these are the engines, as it were, between behind ChatGPT and so on. The letter that was uh, issued by the Future of Life Institute uh, in, in 2023, um, calling upon uh, the everyone to the, those researching in the field to pause research into these so-called giant AI experiments attracted a number of signatures, including that of, of, um, of Elon Musk. But what exactly were they asking for? Here, they spell out precisely what they're asking for. We call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. This pause should be public and verifiable and include all key actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted quickly, government should step in and institute a moratorium. AI labs and independent experts should use this pause to jointly develop and implement, implement a set of shared safety protocols for advanced AI design, design and development that are rigorously audited and overseen by independent outside expert, experts. These protocols should ensure that systems that adhering to them are safe beyond a reasonable doubt. This does not mean a pause on AI development in general, merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever larger, unpredictable black box, black box models with emergent capabilities. Now, I want to focus on that final expression, emergent capabilities. This is something that maybe most people would just pass over, not knowing exactly what it means. So let me unpack this terminology. The terminology refers to the principle of emergence, which is a well-known scientific um, phenomenon that has been described uh, by many people from John Holland onwards and has been uh, written about in the popular media by people like Stephen Johnson. It refers, for example, to the, the kind of phenomenon we see, we see only too often with the murmuration of starlings. What happens in here, we're seeing a video of them coming into roost in the evening in Brighton in England, is that they've performed this very beautiful and complex aerial choreography. What is behind this is the principle of emergence. Now, each of these birds in this flock is just following a simple set of rules. Follow the bird in front, keep a certain distance from the birds all around, and keep going in broadly the same direction at the same speed. 
But out of the aggregation of these uh, of these birds altogether, this multi-agent system, something emerges that is a bottom-up process that is completely unpredictable, and that is what is called emergence. In this case, the aerial choreography that we are seeing in place. But we can see similar examples of emergence in nature in the pheromone trails that are laid by ants, or indeed in the example of slime mold, uh, a multi-agent system composed of thousands of cells that comes together um, as a single slime mold when foraging for food. Now, the point is this, we've seen this many times, we've observed it and it's very easy to see, but scientists have struggled to explain this is, what this is. It doesn't seem to conform to any scientific principles that we know about. Indeed, strong emergence has even been compared to magic. Well, of course, magic doesn't exist. A magician simply plays a trick and pretends that things are magic and while hiding the operations at work. And we can possibly refer also to the work of Arthur C. Clarke, who is reputed to have made the comment that magic is simply something that uh, we haven't been able to explain by scientific means so far. Emergence is certainly one of those properties. It appears magical, and so far there has been no adequate explanation as to what happens. But these emergent capabilities have allowed these large language models, have allowed these GPT and other systems to, to start um, acquiring certain capabilities, certain skills that they have not been programmed for. We'd noticed before how they had allowed uh, certain machines to learn how to play Go without being taught the rules of Go. But now, more incredibly, they've learned how to use language without being given any express instructions about how to use language. They've learned how to translate between different languages. They've learned how to code. And I want to claim they have learned how to design itself. And this itself is both amazing but also potentially terrifying because we don't know what else they've learned. Jeffrey Hinton then is known as the godfather of AI. He's someone who has been championing the work of neural networks for some time. The great grandson of George, of George Boole of Boolean geometry fame. He was born in the UK, studied at the University of Cambridge and in fact enlisted first of all to study architecture but changed courses after two days and studied natural science. He had the conviction that if we were to understand AI, we would do best to work through the model of the brain. And in his research, pursued neural networks, even though they were largely out of favor at the time. Eventually, when computers got more powerful and faster, these neural networks worked and everyone began to follow <clears throat> the example of Jeffrey Hinton, who became the pioneer, as it were, of deep learning. Now, what is interesting about uh, Jeffrey Hinden is that he never predicted these emergent capabilities. He never predicted that these entities would be getting to a point where they can kind of understand things, they can kind of think, and they can have a kind of intelligence. So let's hear what Jeffrey Hinton has to say. It made me realize that these digital intelligences have something we don't have that makes them much better. When one of them knows something, it can tell all the others that's what we don't have with people. So imagine you had 10,000 people, and imagine if when one person learned something, everybody knew it. You could learn a lot more stuff, right? right. And that's why things like ChatGPT knows like 10,000 times as much as any one person. It's because when you train it, there's lots of different copies looking at different bits of the data and learning stuff, and they can all combine what they learn instantly with a bandwidth of like trillions of bits. So can they think? Yes. So imagine the following scenario. I'm talking to chatbot, and we talk for a bit, and the answers it's given me seem a bit strange to me, and I suddenly realize that it thinks I'm a teenage girl. And I say, what demographic do you think I am? And it says it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Um, so the question is, when I said it's, I suddenly realized it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was that a metaphorical use of the word think, or was that just the same way as we use think? 
And I strongly believe that use of the word think, when I said it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was exactly the same way of using think as we do with people. And so that was enough to make you say, what, this has accelerated beyond my comfort level? I suddenly realized maybe they already are better, and making them more like real neural nets isn't the point. They're already better than us. They're a better way of doing learning. And if we make them bigger, they'll get much smarter than us. They already know more than any one person. I, I understand that things could go awry, but I still think that people hear the notion of danger and they dismiss it as hyperbole. I thought it was hyperbole for a long time because I thought these things were a long way off. I thought there will eventually be danger, but I thought um, focusing on it now is unnecessary because it'll be 30 to 50 years before these things get more intelligent than us. But this combination of realizing that they might have a much better way of learning than we have, because they can share knowledge instantly, and seeing things like ChatGPT or Palm at Google that can explain why a joke is funny, made me realize these things are already pretty intelligent, and if they've got a better form of intelligence than ours, then it gets to be much more urgent. The point that Jeffrey Hinton's making is that these entities in the form of ChatGPT are already 10, 000, no, 10,000 times more than any one person. They already have access to all this knowledge and they seem to be developing some kind of capabilities that approximate to human thinking. He uses the expression, to, he talks about a joke here. What, is he, what he's referring to is that he'd asked Palm to explain a joke and it, it had explained that joke very well. And he therefore deduced that if it can explain a joke, it must be able to understand a joke. And he's therefore formulating the notion that these entities have a form of intelligence, in inverted commas, a form of intelligence that is in some ways very different to human intelligence. I like to call it alien intelligence, but it is an intelligence more than nonetheless, and it is an intelligence that is beyond human intelligence. And this is an important point. What we're seeing then is that these systems have been able to reach this level much more quickly than we had imagined. And the alarm that we thought was going to be ahead, way ahead in the future is now upon us. People are concerned about the abilities of AI. Yuval Noah Harari, the uh, Israeli historian and uh, philosopher, if you like, um, has recently argued that AI has hacked the operating system of human civilization. It has hacked language itself. It has learned how to use language. I completely agree with this. I would also argue, however, that it has learned how to design. And it has learned how to design in very much the same way that it has learned language. Again, these systems are not expressly trained in how to use language, but nor are we actually expressly trained in uh, 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 trained ourselves as humans in how to use language or indeed how to use design. Admittedly, there are certain moments in the upbringing of a child when the mother might point out, for example, what a cat is and what a dog is. But on the whole, we absorb things, as it were. We absorb things just by simply being immersed in a situation where people are learning languages, where people are using that language, and we acquire it. In the same way, we acquire the sense of design, I would argue, by being immersed in an architectural culture where people are talking about these things. And this is essentially what's happening with these large language models. They are trained on enormous quantities of data that are situated in particular contexts, much like we might, would be, and they have learnt simply through that particular process. Let me give you some examples about why I think AI has learnt how to design. Many of you would have used Midjourney, and you know that uh, we have to write a prompt we have, to, we have to become prompt engineers and write this prompt, which then we feed to Midjourney, and Midjourney then generates this image based on that information. But the, my point is this, 
in this particular prompt, there were many references to the resolution of the details, to the reality, the hyperrealism of the image, to the lighting conditions and so on that were included in the prompt. But the only reference to any building was to a contemporary modernist house. And the only reference to any landscape, as it were, in the background was to say that it was situated high up in a mountain in, in Austria. Now, I didn't specify the rocks in the foreground, the valley behind, the trees in the valley, the mountains on the horizon. I didn't specify anything about the details of this particular building at all. But what it did was simply generate an image based on that background description. It effectively has learned how to design a building. I didn't have to give it instructions. It generated it automatically. Or take this kitchen, for example. All I said in the prompt, all I wrote in the prompt was contemporary minimalist kitchen. I didn't refer to a, a, a bush and, and, and the outside the kitchen. I didn't refer to a painting on the, on the wall at the end, a painting, I would say, that has been quite well um, designed. I didn't refer to what looks like a coffee maker. On, at the back there, I didn't refer to what looks like a tap. I didn't refer to any of this. I simply mentioned the word kitchen. And all of this was generated by Midjourney version 5.2 all on its own. Or indeed, the way in which certain tectonic materials come together has been, as it were, acquired by the system. Again, we are not actually really taught this in architecture express expressly. We are, over the course of education, we absorb this information. We get to know how you design by being immersed in an architectural culture, how certain materials join each other and so on. And yet what we're seeing here is something that has been generated by a system that understands, in inverted commas, what it is to design. That, to my mind, is precisely why we should be so nervous and worried about these entities, because it will soon be the case that they can design buildings much better than we can if they cannot already do that at the moment. And then look at this particular um, uh, uh, object in the landscape, again, in Austria. Look at the kind of reflections. Look at the kind of the way that the shadows fall and so on. All this has been mastered by Midjourney. No one has instructed it how to do this, what a, a reflection would look like or anything. No one has instructed it how this object should sit on the ground. No one should have instructed it how the mountains should look in the background or the clouds behind the mountains or indeed the grass in the foreground. But all this has been generated through Midjourney in a matter of three to four seconds. No human could compete with the time that Midjourney operates in. And I would, I would claim that very soon, no human is gonna be able to design uh, at the level of sophistication that Midjourney is capable of. <laughs>